Let's uh, get the slide rocking and rolling. I am, uh, I'm Greg Warner. Hello, everybody. It's good to see you today, and I really uh, appreciate you joining us. Uh, I am the, the CEO and founder of a company called Market Smart, and we help um, uh, nonprofits, charities, colleges, universities, um, land meetings with people who have capacity to give major and legacy gifts, especially uh, we help them land them when individuals are ready to be engaged and ready to talk turkey. So that's who I am. I also invented something called the DAF widget and the fundraising report card. Uh, they're both 100% free. It makes me a uh, frustrated philanthropist, I guess I should say. Uh, oh, and Amy says, oh my goodness, you're not wearing your hat. Yeah, I, I, I guess where, I don't know where my hat is. But uh, yes, it, that's, a, that's probably a first in a while. So uh, yeah, I'm the inventor of those free apps, frustrated philanthropist, because I'm putting all my money into this company to help it grow. Uh, so instead of donating uh, as much as I would like, which I still do, but um, I like to build apps uh, the apps that I build, especially in giveaway for free, are probably doing more for the sector than I could with giving money away anyway. So, but uh, yeah, that's a, a little bit about me. I've been doing this presentation about twice a year for the past five years. And I, I kind of came up with this phrase of fundraising climate change. Gosh, it's probably been 10, 12 years now that I've been talking about this. And I, I gave it this label. So if you're new, uh, this will be a very interesting, uh, hopefully, uh, conversation. If, you're, if you've seen this before, you're going to see new numbers, but the idea is probably uh, pretty much the same. So the, um, remember that you can always put questions into the Q&A or into the chat, but I'm going to wait until the very end before I, I start answering them. And right before I get to the Q&A, I am going to give you just like maybe a minute on how Market Smart can help you. That's my little plug for, for my company. Um, if you want to hop off at the very end before my plug, my little ad, uh, feel free to do that. But if you want to stay, then I'll answer questions um, um, before uh, the end. Okay, so uh, just making sure everybody can see my screen. Maybe somebody tell me in the chat that you can. I'm going to get the show on the road. What's going to start um, uh, first? And, and yeah, there we go. All good. They can see it. Great. Thank you. Um, we're going to go through quite a lot of what I'll call dizzying data dizzying data. There's going to be a lot. Um, it's going to be fast. I'm going to pick up the pace here in just a second. And then um, and it, it may make you depressed. <laughs> so don't get depressed because I'm going to give you three powerful strategies for what to do with this information that I'm about to lay on you. All right. Let me get my coffee. Copy in. All right, let's rock. All right. Um, and by the way, all these, a lot of the data, a lot of the data about this comes from one of those applications I built. It's 100% free. You can use it anytime. Just go to fundraisingreportcard.com. It's like a, if anyone knows Tableau or Excel on steroids with chart making and everything, it's the simplest thing. You drag a very basic data file, three data points into this, and you will see your own data so you can get your own metrics. It just, boom, it just makes all these charts for you. And it's uh, amazingly powerful and it's 100% free. Also, if you have trouble getting your data in there and you wanna use it, just reach out to my staff, uh, go to our website, markets, imarketsmart.com or info at imarketsmart.com is our email. I'll talk about that at the end, but you could see your own organization's metrics. Now, if you're like most organizations, you're going to find, if you put your data in there, um, that most are experiencing a shrinking donor base. Some call this uh, donors down, dollars up, uh, because the, there's been an increase in, in revenue, but a shrinking donor base is, is very concerning. So um, the most powerful study I've seen on this recently comes from the Lilly School. 
of philanthropy at Indiana University, where they explained that they found that um, in 2000, the, about two thirds of Americans were giving, donating to some causes, cause or causes. And uh, 18 years later, it dropped uh, to half, half, half of pe people. I mean, that's a, that's a terrible drop. And most of it kind of like falling off a cliff happened uh, in, in the middle of that spread. So after the great recession is when, when most of the drop happened. Now, the amount, the average amount throughout the year that people give to charity is also dropping tremendously. So uh, this is, is, is very concerning. I don't think that's exactly 75%. Anyway, someone's got to help with the math, whoever helped me with these slides. But um, this is weird that so few people are giving and they're dropping out of giving, or if they're giving, they're giving less. Because you would think that with the rise, the increase in the population in the United States, that we would have more people giving. But it's, uh, it, it's not happening. Uh, also, you would think even more so, since more people are moving into the prime giving years, which is the 65 plus years, which is just starting to really, to really grow because the baby boomers are just finally getting into that stage in their lives. And, and we're going to see a growth in the, the, that size, uh, that age group of population for quite some time. And we might have been expecting for decades that when they moved into that area, that there'd be this, this big gifting um, population, but, but fewer people are giving. So that's, that's not, not a good sign. Um, also, I mean, the economy before the pandemic was on track. So we can't say it's the economy over the past 20 years that has done it. I mean, we, we still kind of have historically low unemployment, uh, but the number of people giving to charity is going down. And I, I, I like to compare this stat because companies like Starbucks, like people will spend five bucks on a cup of coffee, but getting five bucks out of them to give it to charity is, is so darn hard. And it's like, wow, how did a cup of coffee end up doing, you know, delivering better value or somehow inspiring people to shell out five bucks. Um, how, how, did, how did that happen? Com like, why are they better at this? I know it's private company and all. And by the way, I see one, one question is, yes, you, you will all get the slides and the recording of this in uh, uh, probably a day or two. All right, um, I'll remind you about that at the end. So why is, why is this happening? I put together four reasons that I think it's happening. They're the same four reasons I've been expressing for uh, a, a decade, but a lot, of, a lot of them are really starting to sort of take uh, or pick up steam, I guess I should say. So number one, and not necessarily in any order, but I, I, I put um, the decline in religiosity is one of the reasons why this donor base um, is shrinking. So if you look at the number of people who state that they have no religion in the United States, that has been steadily increasing of recent years. Um, and th this ties in with, with this report um, from a couple of years back that just one sentence, and it said that the, the more important religion is to a person, the more likely they are to give to a charity of any kind. That's what they found. So um, it makes sense that if people are feeling less religious, then giving would go down or the numbers of people that would give would go down. So here's um, from uh, the, the, um, the same report is the, the giving to religion as a share of total giving uh, is, is also going down. So if you're working for religious institutions, this is something to be concerned about. Uh, also, you probably already know that church membership is on the decline. Now, there is a fairly serious drop you'll see in 2020, but I just want to remind you, like, that was the pandemic, so I, I don't know if, if that, that further drop 
getting it to less than half of Americans for the first time uh, since this has been studied, that may be because of the pandemic, all right? So we'll see, in fact, next year, I guess we'll see if there's a bump. But another reason is because there's this increase in um, like acceptance of socialism. So we should, you should recognize that capitalism fuels uh, philanthropy and charitable giving. The most capitalistic countries have the highest rates of charitable giving. Countries that are full on socialism don't have any charitable giving and that makes sense because the government takes care of everything. So um, there has been a, a increase in, in um, receptivity, if you will, to socialism in America. And I pulled this from before the, the, the last election. I mean, actually maybe, yeah, it's, it's a couple of years ago now. Of, I just found it fascinating that so many um, likely Democratic caucus goers had felt that they'd be okay with a, um, their politicians being more socialist. So not getting political here, just kind of explaining that that is gonna have a, an effect on our uh, sector. The, similar to this or the opposite side of the coin is that favorability of capitalism has fallen across all age groups. So you can see that, uh, of course, it's, it's more so with the younger generations but uh, still falling just the same. All right, number three, number three reason is that trust among the donor base, our society is, is declining, which is also very concerning because no transaction, no monetary tra transaction ever happens without trust. People just don't give money or buy, you know, pay for things unless they trust the people they're giving the money to. So this study from give.org uh, sought to determine where people are, like, are they, is this increasing or decreasing or where are we? And what they found is that only 10% of uh, the respondents felt that they would give more to charity or, or that they trust chari charities more while 32%, a third, said that they trust charities less. Uh, and among the 32% that trust it less, they asked, "Would you? Um, are you optimistic in your trust improving over time? And only 10% of that 32% felt that they, they, they were likely to increase their trust over time. Um, this is supported also by the Edelman Trust Barometer, which is a worldwide measure of all kinds of things, but also the non-governmental organizations. And by the way, you'll notice it, when you get these slides and everything, everything is, uh, I, I put in all the links to where I found this stuff. Um, so you can check it out too. But yeah, this is interesting because there was a, a huge drop in 2018 of 9% people becoming less trusting in um, NGOs. And then what's even worse is that it's, uh, it was a, a minus 23% drop among what they call the informed public, which I liken to being, um, is likely to be your major gift donors, okay? Uh, I think that more educated people are likely to, more likely to make major gifts and legacy gifts. In fact, that's been supported, uh, I'm pretty sure, in several realms, but I don't have that, that data in here. Now, even worse, when you're talking about trust, and this is kind of fascinating because I work for a private sector company, well, I own it, is that um, for the first time, there's been kind of this, this overtaking of trust, or, or I, how do I say this, is that Nonprofits are trusted less now than private business. Uh, uh, that might hit some of you in the gut, but that's just what their data says. Uh, so this is, this is not good. If people don't trust you and your organization, they're not gonna fork over their hard earned cash. Uh, so then when you, when you pile all this together, 
and add the, let's put some cherries on top is that the competition for your donor dollars is increasing because there are more like kitchen counter charities uh, nipping at your heels and also donor advised funds and family foundations and such are, are providing value to donors and kind of moving the money away from you. So if, if the bottom line is there's, there's, more, um, there's more areas, there's more places for people to donate their money to. And uh, as the competition increases, it just makes it harder for each individual organization. Nevertheless, as I said at the very beginning, give, giving keeps growing. The total dollar amount reached a record last year of 471 billion. I think uh, the 2021 numbers are gonna come out in a couple months. And I think we might hit over, um, over half a billion, I mean, half a trillion dollars, which is, so it just keeps going up while the number of people giving to charity is going down and the average gift is going down. So this is, I mean, not average gift, the average total amount that people give is going down. So uh, anybody see anything like odd with this? Like this is strange. I think we can all come to the conclusion. It's pretty clear that it's the wealthy that are making up the losses. Um, we've found in the fundraising report card that the average in single donation amount is going up. It is going up. Now that's warped though, because there are so many big outliers so that even if the small donations are going down, the, the outliers will make the, the total, the average donation going up. Um, it, well, you know, go on this tra trajectory. So I wouldn't get too excited about that because here's where the rub comes in is that, and look at the yellow bars first, is that first time new donor retention. This means after they give the first time and they are a first time donor, do they retain? Do they give again? And uh, according to our our report card, again, there's a 10,000 plus organizations putting their data in here of all types and uh, over $100 billion that we, we are monitoring every day. So you could see this is this is kind of um, this isn't good. <laughs> this isn't good, and in fact, it it reached by the end of 2021. I think I pulled this a little early. It was more around 16 percent for. Um, well, here I'll get to that in just a second. That's for low dollar donations. But um, whoops, the reactivated donors. So these are ones that lapsed and then they were reactivated to give again that kind of started perking up, but then started declining again. So I, I, we did a little happy dance in 2018, but it's, it's kind of, it's, it's just going back down again. And then finally you have repeat donor retention. So this is the percentage of retained donors from last year that then repeated after they were retained. Hope that makes sense. That's a little rockier. And actually I would, I would, uh, um, well, it's declining again, but the um, it you would assume that someone who gives and then gives again is more likely to repeat, and that's why these numbers are better than the other two. So where this gets a lot more interesting is when you start looking at the difference between under $100 donors and donors who are giving larger gifts. Um, interestingly, in September of 2020, we looked at the donor retention rate and it was much higher, but that was an anomaly. It, it, it had never, we hadn't seen it pop up that high. I think it had something to do with the, the pandemic, I guess, uh, but not really sure. But what's really concerning is that at the end of last year, like I started to say just a minute ago, is that when we look at under $100 donors, that uh, retention rate has really come down. It's really come down. It used to be thought that it's pretty much one in five new donors would retain, which is terrible. But uh, now it's, it's more like one in six, I guess, if I'm doing my math right there. So that's not, that's not good. Uh, drop from 20% down to 16%. 
the the anonym uh, the anomaly, if you will, is that, and I know this gets kind of small. The fundraising effectiveness project found that during the pandemic, it, in those first few months, we did see an increase in people donating and in donations, and also uh, there was a twelve percent increase in new donors. So emergencies tend to bring people to to give which is great. But if we don't retain them, then we have a really big problem. So what you might be seeing is, is the aftershock of the increase of all these new donors. And frankly, um, we may be seeing that nonprofits just did a really terrible job overall in retaining them. So again, I, I encourage you to take your data or call us and we'll help you to put it in the fundraising report card and see how you compare to these kinds of numbers, um, especially in the $5,000 and up category. We're looking at um, when you go up to the higher numbers, you end up, they, you tend to have um, less fluctuation. So yes, it's come down a little bit uh, from last year and a half ago to this year, but uh, it's nothing like what we saw in the under $100 donor uh, realm. The, the $5,000 and up donors are just playing more stable and that, that makes sense. So here's a side-by-side -side comparison of, of how to look at this when you're comparing the under $100 donors, those are the low dollar donors, with the over $5,000 donors. And what you can see is that the average new first time donation for low dollar donors, it's just 25 bucks. For um, major donors, it's almost 41,000. Uh, it's interesting, when I first got into this, a lot of people would tell me that, well, you have to understand the fundraising pyramid and you, know, you get people to give 25 bucks and then you work them up. Uh, I haven't really seen that in the data. I think that's a bit of a myth. Maybe it works for some organizations, but mostly, I mean, we are seeing more and more that people will, with wealth, uh, they, don't, they don't know about your pyramid. <laughs> they just kind of come in and give what they want. And this data shows that it's more like on average $41,000, which is, of course, probably, there's probably some outliers in that, but even so, uh, you know, it's probably more like five or ten thousand dollars, and um, you, some of you out there may may notice this more than me. I'm just looking at the data, so you have the anecdotal sense about what's going on. All right, so here's where it really gets bad, though. Well, may, maybe that was bad before, but expected. But again, the uh, this is just those same numbers, but side to side is the donor retention rate for low dollar donors is just like off a cliff. It's it just keeps getting worse every year. Uh, I've been, like I said, I've been doing this for a decade. I, I've never seen it this bad. Um, meanwhile, the donor retention rate for the $5,000 and up donors is relatively stable. And um, lastly is the lifetime value. So you have to think about if you're an annual fund, like what are you investing to get a donor to give? Because uh, your lifetime value of that donor is only gonna be about 45 five bucks, while uh, for a major donor, it's going to be 75,000 bucks on average. And that doesn't include legacy gifts, of course, but yeah, that's, that's a he heck of a comparison. So, um, all right, let's keep it moving. Uh, I, I like to apply the Pareto principle to this, also known as the 80-20 rule, where it used to be said that 20% of your donors are going to make up 80% of your revenue. Uh, that is way off and far from the truth now. It's, uh, you're looking at 0.74% of your donors is going to make up 76% of your revenue. So donors giving over $5,000, what, what I mean is when we look at the data, it's, it's about three quarters of 1%, a fraction of 1% are going to make up 76% of your revenue. And again, you'll want to see how this compares to your organization, but this is on average. The donors giving under $100 are, um, that's about 77% of your donor base, if you're like most organizations, but they only make up almost 5% of total donation revenue. 
So you have to think about all the effort, time, money, ex uh, what, what, you're, what you're expending in order to get those low dollar donors that um, make up most of your donor base, but not much of your, um, of your total revenue and certainly don't retain it anywhere near, it's less than half the retention rate of uh, the higher dollar donors. So, all right, quick poll. Let me make sure I know how to do my poll. Compared to five years ago, do you feel that fewer people are donating? I'm gonna launch this poll and let's see what all of you uh, think. I wonder if, if you all think I'm nuts or um, if the data is, is true and your anecdotal sense is, is in line. So I'm gonna give it a, another seven seconds. A lot of votes actually still pouring in here. A lot of votes, very participative audience. Thank you, this is great. You keep voting, so I'm gonna hold it open. All right, looks like it's ending. I'll give you three seconds, two, one, zero. All right, here we go, let's see. So we got the absolutely is 57%. Uh, let me share this actually with y'all. Um, yeah, so absolutely 57%, definitely not 20%. And then there's the not sure crowd, 25%. All right, well, we'll have to see. Maybe some of you will use the fundraising report card and see what the truth is for your organization. Uh, so, okay, this, this, this really hits hard at a notion that I call populist fundraising. This is, um, has actually become kind of controversial recently in some, some areas because all of us want to be uh, more equitable and democratic, if you will, in, in how philanthropy happens. We don't want the very, very few um, taking control of, of our, um, the, the nonprofits and organizations that serve the needy and such. Um, that would be bad. We want it to be democratic, if you will. And, uh, but the, populist approach, it, it tends to work best, frankly, with uh, politicians, uh, a populist fundraising approach, because in that regard, when you ask for a few bucks, uh, meaning a politician does, then you're essentially getting votes. You know, those are people who are sort of committing to voting. And that's, that's kind of a populist model. But philanthropy, uh, it doesn't work quite, quite as well and I'm concerned that the, we have to balance, frankly, like the democratic aspects that we desire from uh, philanthropy and philanthropists and our organizations with this populist approach that is very costly. So if you can, I guess what I'm saying is, if you can afford the populist model, or at least a balancing where that's, that's, more favorable with the populist model, and um, then you, and meaning sending messages and communicating with everybody and and all that. If you can afford it, then of course we want to do it. But if you can't, which is kind of most, I think, then you'll you'll probably want to consider a, a different model. Now, one place where the populist approach does apply though, is in legacy giving to a degree. And I say that because anybody can make a legacy gift and very often the people who make them have never even donated, which is pretty cool. Um, so that serves to, to make you wonder, well, should we be promoting legacy giving to everybody? Well, in part, maybe it's a yes, but the data shows that there's still an 80-20 rule in, 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 um, in effect, at least according to this study, another one from the Lilly School, 82% um, of legacy gift dollars come from 20% of the donors and 66% come from 10% of the donors. Now, Dr. James studied this in a different way and what he found was fascinating to me and I'm still like, it's a jaw dropper is he found that 96.2% of total charitable gift bequest dollars come from just 1% of the, 
that's one out of a thousand donors, and that um, just 3.8% of the bequest dollars come from the other 99.9%. So what this tells us is that there are huge outliers that are, and, and you know, you're welcome to, to read Dr. James' book, and he's got it all sourced and everything here, and you can get that book available on my website. But this tells me that legacy gifts are really not legacy gifts, uh, especially if they're disclosed and people are still alive. Um, I call them leads, especially because in this book, Dr. James says that only about 60% of legacy gifts that are disclosed and you put them in your legacy society and such, only I think it's about 60% actually happen. Um, so there's a retention problem with legacy giving too. And I look at any legacy gift disclosure or shots, uh, um, show of interest in legacy giving as a lead for, um, of course, closing the legacy gift and retaining it, but also finding outliers. So um, we, I could talk about that for an hour, but I, I wanna stay on topic here is the reason why this is happening is because um, it, in addition to the other reasons that I laid out before is that the channels are fragmenting. This is making it harder for you to market to people. We used to just have a few. If you're a Gen Xer like me, I mean, we had a, like seven channels and stuff on TV and a few on radio. And But now we got everything. I mean, there's channels upon channels upon channels. And um, that just changes the what how hard it is for you, frankly, to... Um, to communicate with your audiences. Now, the um, what's also happened is because of the internet, people are feeling more, more self-sufficient. They're able to take care of things themselves. They're able to research. You know, this is why people know everything they need to know about a car, for instance, before they go to buy it. So Penelope Burke, and if you've ever read her stuff, it's amazing. And she, she, um, she's studied this and, and talked about donor self-sufficiency in this magazine article that is linked to where she surveyed 3,000 bequest donors and asked, do you have a planned gift officer? And on, less than one out of five said yes. And even them, uh, among them said, like, look, I, I, they're great. Yeah, but I, I, I do what I need on my own. I, I don't need much. So uh, that's interesting, especially though, when you think about the 80-20 rule, I think it's, it's, it's a pretty decent conclusion that the people who are wealthier have um, resources that they can tap into for this. So in, in my book that I wrote, gosh, it's seven years ago now, I don't know, something like that. Uh, I called this the four selves. And this is where people want to self-qualify. They want to self-educate. They want to self-involve. And that especially, which is going to be uh, odd for you to hear, is they want to self-solicit. That It's interesting because fundraising, I have found, is not really about asking as much as a lot of consultants want to say it is. But it's more about helping supporters self-solicit helping them recognize that they can make such impact and they would get so much value from it that they raise their hand and say, I want in, help me, help me do it. Um, all right, so another reason why uh, this is happening, I believe, is because the preferences are changing not just the channels, but people don't like the old school way of doing things. I mean, I remember when I had my first sales job, I, I was a cold caller. I made 30,000 cold calls, I, I, I gathered at one point. And um, this is just not like acceptable anymore. <laughs> this has changed. Yet, and we even have laws against spam, but like charities technically don't have to abide by them. I mean, they would get shut down, but it's just um, emailing people irrelevant information and content when they don't want it. They just put you in their junk mail drawer and then nothing happens. So th this is an interruptive kind of nature that, that just it, people don't like anymore. All right, so I'm gonna speed it up because I'm talking too slow according to my timer. So if competition 
is increasing and less people are giving and trust is declining and a fraction of your donor base is making up most of the revenue, you have these fragmented channels and these preferences are changing, like what, what the heck is going on, right? So others are seeing this now. You've got the chair of uh, the, the uh, Giving USA, the, that's the Growth and Giving uh, Initiative had written this, is that it's, it, it, the dollars are increasing from larger gifts and the smaller and mid-level donors are sort of disappearing. And this is across the board, as you just saw. And then Brian, uh, he, he wrote from Network for Good that organizations across the board are being challenged by this. And most organizations are finding themselves, unfortunately, flat-footed. So, all right, let's go hit another poll here and see, do you believe <laughs> in fundraising climate change? And bear with me, I got to find the other poll. Poll two, I'm going to launch it. Let's see what people say. Hopefully you're seeing that there. All right, the votes are pouring in. A very engaged crowd again, I appreciate that. It's interesting to see what's going on here. And I hope I'm not just persuading you. I guess clearly I might have tilted this a little bit, but all right, I'll give you three seconds. Three, two, one. I'm gonna end the poll and I'm gonna share the results. Well, that's, that's pretty cool. All right, either I totally convinced you or you all had felt like this before and now you're getting confirmation. But yeah, fundraising climate change is real. I, 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 I'd love to meet uh, the one out of 91, <laughs> but uh, you don't have to present yourself. So, okay, I'll stop sharing that and we'll, we'll continue moving ahead. So what the heck should you do, right? And I got, I got just enough time to tell you what you should do. And guess what? It's not more. You should not do more of everything that you're already doing. Because remember, the donor preferences are changing. And a lot of people are just fed up. Like if you ask your family or friends how they feel about all the solicitations they get and the way that they're treated or you know, uh, uh, from, from the charities that they love, uh, my, my anecdotal sense is that people say they're not exactly thrilled with the experience and we want them to get happy, right? So what makes people happy is when you treat them with fairness and respect and you give them control, um, you've asked for permission and allowed them to opt in to uh, communications, you've given them a chance to self-navigate the decision-making process of giving and you make it unbelievably convenient. And this can apply to major gifts and legacy gifts too. So this is what I call, this is, these all contribute to a value equation. The bottom line is uh, you have to ask yourself, what value are we really delivering? Because no exchange of money happens without trust and especially without an exchange of value. If your organization is not giving something, and I don't mean like recipes or, or labels uh, uh, for, for you know, uh, calendars, that's not the kind of value I'm talking about because that's transactional value. What kind of relational value are you supplying? And how are you monitoring whether people feel that the value is good and they're saying they're ready? They're ready for you to reach out, especially the major donors, or ready for you to solicit them. So hounding people, we all know this naturally, hounding people and pouncing on them and pounding on them to give, that doesn't work. It burns bridges, and that's why we're seeing the um, new donor retention rate just in the toilet, especially among the low dollar donors, is because they're not given value and they're treated poorly. So what's going to happen is, like in every sector and every business, is there's going to be winners and losers. Um, they're, they're going to, to shake out over the next 10 years. And uh, you, the purpose of this is I'm trying to raise awareness and, and kind of warn you that the way to, to deal with this is by reinvention and mostly through the use of technology. That's what most um, of the reinventions that we've seen occur in our society that I just flashed with those three kinds of um, sectors. Technology is always the common denominator between the winners versus the losers because technology helps you do more with less. It, it will help you sort of surf past 
the fundraising climate change and you could let everybody else do do the you know what 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 they they've been doing but you can sort of uh, surf past this and your board will be happy your fundraising team your your donors especially if you leverage technology properly so um that brings us to um uh, really what you can do about it. So let's, I have, I promised at the beginning of this that I would give you three ideas. Uh, none of them, unfortunately, are a quick fix, right? So this traditional interruptive transactional arm's length approach clearly from the data is not working and it's, it's getting worse. It's even picking up steam, yet that's where most organizations spend most of their money. Um, it's usually focused on, on asking for small gifts and uh, re requiring a bit of impulsiveness from donors, right? So you gotta hit them at the right time with the right message and all that. But again, they don't retain anyway from that. So it's, it's very costly. So I recommend a more contemporary technology enabled compassionate approach that is slower but the tortoise beats the hare every time. So you got to, your leadership especially needs to develop a sense uh, uh, for patience. I know it's hard for, uh, people love the transactional nature because you send stuff out and then you get money in, but it's, it's not good for the long term. Um, the, the idea is rather to help supporters self-navigate the decision-making process, which is more challenging to do and it takes more time, but this is what, really affects the highly considered non-transactional decision-making process. This is how relational decisions get made. This is how you deliver true value and make people happy. So they'll wanna give more and make legacy gifts. So my first recommendation is to focus on the 80-20, like look in our fundraising report card, see how you're doing and if this brings true for you and how you're doing in terms of retaining donors. But especially, I think you should re recalibrate your budgets to spend a little more on your major gifts approaches and your legacy gifts approaches and even maybe mid-level and, and find ways to get off that like treadmill, that hamster wheel of donor acquisition that is just gonna keep costing more money. I mean, the paper costs are going up, printing costs are going up, postage costs are going up. All the costs are gonna only continue to go up for that kind of marketing. So um, I, I don't recommend it. Frankly, I've told people, I don't think they should try to acquire donors. They should try and acquire members, subscribers, people who are engaged, and then uh, generate leads to sort through and find major gifts, mid-level gifts, legacy gifts. Uh, per, po, uh, honestly, if only 5% of your revenue is coming from the new donors and the low, the low dollar donors, like what are you doing? <laughs> what are you actually doing? So instead, I recommend find new major donors and mid-level donors, and you can do this through referrals, especially. I recommend in board meeting packets, especially, and if you have a, a solid board with capacity, ask them about their friends. A ask them to introduce you to them. I mean, that should be every single quarter you, you're asking them for that. Just put even a, a, a little blank sheet of paper for them to fill it out. Uh, another place to find them is they're, they're, by the way, they're right in your midst. These are your volunteers. Your volunteers are, are there and 50% of them, 49.7, are high net worth individuals. They are also, they say, they're testing you. They test it, several, they, they work at, uh, and help several organizations and they're going to try and decide which one is actually worthy of their, their high capacity. Um, and lastly, from this study, they, they want to give. I mean, 84% of them give. They're going to give. So aside from looking for them in referrals, look for them in your volunteers. Create offers for engagement so you can get to know them and uh, invite them to learn about ways they can give and support the organization. Another way, and, and we do this too, uh, I mean, I, but I'm trying to put in other companies here. This one, BWF. They, they did um, a little test here where they just acquired um, subscribers 
for digital major gift lead generation. And they ended up, when they looked at all the subscribers they acquired, 43 of them were new major donor prospects. Now this, this little campaign, of course, I'm sure it doesn't count the cost for BWF, but it only cost 900 bucks and they got 43 new major donors out of their subscribers. So, um, or prospects, not major donors, but prospects. So there's, there's ways to acquire people with major capacity. Number two is support your supporters. Like I've been talking about this is show them value. Uh, and a lot of showing value is showing that you actually care about them. Uh, sending crass solicitous solicitation messages all the time doesn't show that you really care about them. It shows that you care about their money and that's about it. And that's pretty off putting. So understanding where they are in the consideration process and who they are and why they care is essential. And in fact, Dr. James, if anyone's seen his new research and his new books um, and our training course, if you're in our training course with Dr. James, you'll, you will know that his research found that the key is to constantly connect people to why they care. That's something you need to do over and over and over and over again. And that shows that you're focusing on them and you actually care about them and their story, not so much about your story and how great your organization is. Now, this will be news to most uh, leaders in organizations and consultants because they're very interested in these kinds of designs. Like, this is what we do. We identify, qualify, cultivate, all this kind of stuff. But it's, this is all internal stuff. This, there's nothing here about delivering value in these kinds of ideas or where each donor uh, resides in the consideration continuum. So I think this kind of chart is more important than the one about what you're going to do. And it's, it, will, it, it, it will help you in both of these areas, but mostly for the highly, high dollar, highly considered decisions. So what I mean by that is that with a slower approach where, for instance, uh, with BWF's example, you acquire a subscriber and then maybe you ask them questions about themselves after they've subscribed online and then you find out why they care and then you engage with them over the long term uh, in meaningful ways and providing information that aligns with their why. And then when they reach the how stage, uh, which you can determine either by asking them, where are you in the process or by monitoring where they're clicking online and such, that's where you want to have a major gift officer enter into the picture. And then after they give, they go right back into the why stage. Like, why should I give again? Uh, I know I'm going kind of fast here, but the, the, the trick is to build trust because, and you can do that if you think about them all the time. Think about them and not reporting on how great you are so much. I know this is a little controversial and not exactly what every fundraiser uh, or consultant will tell you to do, but I'm telling you, this is what works. We've seen it at Market Smart, and this is what Dr. James says works, so I'm going with him. So one of the ways you could do this is, uh, is starting the process to show that you care about them is by collecting information about them using donor surveys. I call this uh, tech-enabled donor discovery. It is an enablement of technology to discover more about donors. The problem uh, that I created with this, and not that I invented surveys, but 10, 12, 12 years ago, 14 years ago, when I started doing this for organizations and then we, we, we created Market Smart. Um, since then, like a dozen or more companies have decided, yeah, sur surveys are a great thing. Let's, let's do them. We can sell printing. We can sell consulting. We can sell all kinds of stuff to the nonprofit sector with surveys. The problem with, is, and I've looked at so many um, data files, is that organizations that survey donors and they just use it for research because they want to learn stuff, you know, for their benefit. If you don't show the donors that you listened altered your practices, uh, care about them, uh, then all that research actually does you no good or less, no worse than no good because what we've seen is that um, surveying donors without changing anything uh, makes them defect. They, we've seen the data that people who took a survey but didn't get personalized, relevant, value-oriented cultivation that 
that showed that you listened to them actually give less. So be very, very, very careful with surveys. Uh, I, I wrote a long blog post on this. Do not ever survey people for pure research purposes um, unless it's it's clear that you're not going to change it a damn thing for them, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but otherwise, make sure that you you engage with every survey taker uh, ongoing after they take the survey and and treat them uh, because they will remember. All right. So if you go it on your own, you could get my guide for how to conduct these donor surveys on your own. Um, of course, we can help you with that at Market Smart. Now, another thing you'll want to do is create a microsite that's just for major givers. And uh, here's an example. Well, this isn't a microsite for major giving. This is a regular college microsite, this too. But what you wanna do is you wanna create this kind of VIP zone that has opportunities to give uh, uh, people, uh, well, from their donor advised fund, for instance, you could use my DAF widget to, to round that out. Um, that's got like every donor advised fund, it's thousands now. Um, and also, uh, you're going to want different content there because major donors don't need the same content that everybody else gets. In fact, they want different kinds of content and words and pictures, and it should be slightly bigger, more white space, easy to use on a tablet because these are usually older folks. So this is just an example, and I'm kind of moving it along. Of course, at Market Smart, we could show you tons, hundreds of examples of this stuff. Um, but the idea is to, when you have one of those kind of pages, you really want to monitor who's clicking where. Because for instance, if one of your donors clicks on giving from a donor advised fund, you want to know that that happened by name. Um, so monitoring digital body what language, of course, you need certain technology for that is important. But a, a click up there is a lot better than a click down here, for instance. So here's the last, uh, the last um, idea is is and I is getting kind of redundant, but I give to your givers. You know this law of reciprocity is unbelievably powerful. Everybody uses it. You know when leaders of state go from one country to another, the first thing they do is give the other leader uh, a gift. I was talking to somebody just yesterday at a private uh, private school, K through twelve. And they were like, we're, we have so many people who are disengaged. We, we need to re-engage them. I said, send them the digital version of their yearbook or at least an offer that you'll give it to them if they, if they fill out a form, you know, get them re-engaged, but it's by delivering value. Maybe like, maybe sometimes you want to give value to someone who said that they told you that they left you in their legacy, in their, in their will. Right. And, and maybe they want to gain some kind of notoriety from that. All right. That's cheap. You don't have to pay any money to give someone notoriety. Plus, it'll inspire others to do the same. Um, or you could give them, but this is more so if they're in the action stage of giving and they're really considering it, then you can give them content or, or meet with them to talk about giving. But you generally don't want to make this kind of offer of value when people haven't really gotten into that stage. I see a lot of mass marketing for this. It's kind of like fishing expedition where you send an offer like this to thousands and thousands of people. It's, it, it's kind of wasteful. If I were you, I would just send it to the people who say that they want it. All right, so we're getting near the end here. Here's wrapping up is you want to focus the three, three, three um, strategies, focus on the 80-20, support your supporters and give to your givers. So, um, oh, and last thing is, and I mentioned this earlier, but every legacy, every supporter, every subscriber, every member is a legacy lead. And don't ever forget, maybe you wanna use this graphic for your boss or something that like someone who gives an annual fund donation every single year, I mean, that's nice, but like Sharon giving an average legacy gift here, uh, it would take Donna like 228 years to equal what Sharon did. So like why people overlook this, I know it requires patience, but why people overlook it just is, is nuts to me. So, all right, this is uh, all our contact information. If you wanna learn more, you can use the fundraising report card and such. Um, of course, contact us anytime. I'm gonna get to questions, but first really quick, I'm gonna explain 
what the heck is market smart? And I'll go backwards just for a second here is whoops. Um, so yeah, what we do is we help organizations focus on that 80-20 and um, help the donors move themselves through the consideration process, through this process of uh, using a, our survey system for donor uh, discovery. And then the, our system thinks about what the donors said so that the um, cultivation process can begin. And it, it's automated by AI. So it thinks about what you should say to every single donor a, in a personalized, highly relevant way. The more that you cultivate, the more they'll move themselves. Well, they'll click on your, your, your website. And we found that these VIP sites, people who engage with them give 300% more. So uh, we, we know that it works. It got the case studies to prove it. Happy to show you in a no pressure kind of demo. Um, but this helps, this process of cultivation and patience helps donors move themselves through the consideration continuum. And, and then you get alerts telling you who exactly by name is ready for your outreach or the system actually sets appointments for you with them on your calendar so you can have a chat. So the prioritization is key so that you understand who you should be meeting right now since you don't have a lot of time and time is of the essence and you wanna be spending it with people uh, who, who are most likely to really move the needle. So that's what Market Smart does. We, uh, we, we like to see 10 times the um, uh, investment. So if you invest uh, in our system, we in fact guarantee that you'll get 10 times the return on investment. So you'll wanna think about uh, what kind of ROI you get with anything else. If you're not getting 10 to one ROI somewhere, you should probably consider this. And um, uh, lifetime ROI, we see about 100 to one. So here's just one little um, uh, testimonial, but we have case studies. And then I'll move along uh, after just telling you that if you consider a small part of your budget uh, and this 10 to one ROI offer, we'd love to talk to you. Just contact us at imarketsmart.com. All right, so let's go into the q and I'm going to start by looking into the chat. Um, and see, feel free to use the q and I'm just going to kind of check in here. There's a whole bunch of nice comments. Thank you. Um, a lot of people saying I'm right with you. Right on, Greg. Thanks. Okay, cool. Let's go to the Q&A. All right. Wow. Do you think that COVID influenced the number for 2020 in the categories of retention? Donors gave once due to COVID. Yes. Uh, Natalie, I believe that is uh, yeah, I, I believe that COVID, of course, had a massive, uh, there was a tremendous influx of donors, according to the Fundraising Effectiveness Project. And I guess when you increase volume, uh, generally, you're, you're only going to create an aberration of the um, retention rate which since retention rates were going down, the aberration just made it worse. So I, I don't know if you were here earlier, but I do think that it's gonna go back up from 16% up to about 20%. So um, let's see. Oh, so Gary, all right, thank you. You gave me a uh, typo fix there. Um, any advice for fundraisers where leadership goals, metrics, culture, contravene the donor preferences you so aptly describe. Many organizational leaders worked for, talk about donors like objects. Wow, this anonymous attendee who wrote this. All right, so yeah, Dr. James' research is really pretty much all about this. Uh, I've been talking about it. Many people um, refer, refer to me as the pissed off donor who started a uh, private sector business because I'm ticked off and I wanna fix this, right? And this is probably why me and Dr. James are so good friends is because he's proved it with all his research. And um, the, the problem is that fundraising leaders and some board members have a hero story of their own that they wanna tell. And it, it contradicts with the hero story that donors want. So donors wanna be the hero in their lives, uh, administrators, leaders want to be the hero in their lives. 
to be the hero as an administrator means treating the donor not like a hero. And that's what you're talking about when you say that they, um, they, they treat them like objects or ATM machines. So the trick is, uh, is a little bit challenging, but, uh, and, and I can't go through it all right here, but the trick is to A, number one, rouse your leaders by letting them know that they're losing at a terrible rate. And most of the money is going to donor advised funds and foundations because they provide much better value to donors than the transactional approach and the hero story that they have to compete with of the administrators. There's other things that you can do after you rouse them with that, but I don't have enough time to go into it. So feel free to reach out to me if you want, or you could take the course, uh, Dr. James course, which is available on, on our website. Uh, next, to what extent can we leverage on cultural backgrounds of donors to motivate their giving habit and increase major gifts. Okay, so, uh, and that's from Nigeria. Thank you, AJ. Um, interestingly, uh, Dr. James proved this in, in his most recent research also, is that uh, um, relevance matters. Uh, sending a person who is similar to the donor to talk to them or sending communications from a similar person to them uh, is going to increase giving among them. People feel more trusting as much as, you know, we're still human beings, <laughs> but people feel more trusting when people that approach them are like them. So culture matters. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, though, in because it dawned on me that maybe you're asking, like, are different cultures just not in, inclined to give? And that that's true. I mean, different cultures are, are less inclined to give, especially, like I said, in socialist, especially authoritarian countries, they're just not going to give. The government does it all. So I hope that helped. Uh, do I have stats for the Canadian market? Unfortunately, Natalie, I don't, um, I don't have those stats. Sorry. Let's see here. Um, Gary, okay. How can Market Smart help a volunteer run, not yet funded whoo, nonprofit, raise funds to beta test plus perfect our innovative tools? Um, I'd have to learn more about what you're talking about there with innovative tools and all this, but it sounds like you're starting a, a nonprofit from scratch. Uh, to me, the way to do that is very much the way we start businesses from scratch is you go get funding. So that means don't start with trying to send direct mail to a whole bunch of people. You start with concentric circles. First, you find like private equity investors, then you find other investors, or first you go to family and friends, or you know, go to the people you know, and then go to other investors that they know, and then other and other. You have to think about one-to-one, -one, hand hand-to-hand combat and, and meeting with people who have capacity who will fund the operation and get it off the floor, in my personal opinion. That's how most businesses are started. So I don't think uh, uh, it, there's, there should be a difference for nonprofits. I know most people don't do it that way. They start with a, a gala or a walk or a 5K run or something like that. Um, I just, I, I don't agree with that methodology. It's transactional in nature and it doesn't set a solid foundation. So, all right, let's see if there's any more questions in here. I think unless there's anything else, um, I'll give you a five and 10 seconds maybe to get something in here. Otherwise, I, I wanna thank you very much for your interest in this topic and encourage you that if you wanna learn more about what we do at Market Smart, happy to help. Never any pressure in meeting with us. It's always uh, purely educational and uh, fun kind of meeting. And uh, we just like to see if it's a fit. So if it's not a fit, then we won't work together. It's all good. All right. Thank you, everybody. It was a pleasure seeing you. And I wish you all the best of luck. Until next time, signing out. Have a great afternoon. Thanks. Bye.